All right, what 4.1 part B, we're looking at the bias sampling techniques. So using a method that will consistently overestimate or underestimate the value that we want to know is called bias sampling. You've heard the word bias in everyday language, but we don't want our sample to be biased. So we have to look at what makes it bias. So choosing individuals from a population who are easy to reach results in what we call a convenience sample. This is a biased sampling method. And let's look at this example so you can see what I'm saying. Ask the first 30 students who enter a school library in the morning, how much time did they spend doing homework last night? Well, if I'm looking for the average time all students spend doing homework and I only ask those who come in the library first thing in the morning, there's a problem here. Okay, students that go to the library first thing in the day are more likely to be studious or most more so than the average student. So this will probably overestimate the population average for all students. So anytime you accuse something of having bias, you have to say, what is it going to do? Is it going to overestimate the, um, the value I'm looking for or underestimate it? So in this case, it would overestimate the average time students study because these kids are probably more studious. Okay, a second bias sampling technique that's not a good choice is what we call a voluntary response sample. And it consists of people who choose themselves by responding to a general invitation. Um, this is where people call in, write in, things like that. Um, the problem is it does not represent the whole population because they often attract people who feel strongly about an issue. Like people will call into the radio if they feel strongly about this thing or they'll fill out a survey of, or a, a Google review about a business they had a bad experience with. So those results are often biased one way or the other um, because of strong feelings. Examples of this, online polls, um, call-in voting, email surveys, anything of that nature where someone chooses themselves for the survey is a voluntary response survey. Now, even if a um, sampler has done the work and they've done a stratified or a clustered or just a simple random sample done it well there can still be bias you can never completely eliminate bias so um, there are some issues that can occur even though the methodology was good so the first one is called under coverage and it occurs when some members of the population just cannot be chosen in a sample they just simply don't get the, they don't get the survey that's an under coverage thing. So look at this example. Surveys conducted about increasing funding for Medicare by calling randomly selected landlines. Well, if you're calling landlines, not everybody in the country has landlines these days. So there's a problem here. And that many younger people, people don't own landlines. So this will most likely overestimate the number of people who'd be in favor of Medicaid, Medicaid funding being increased. Because think about it, it's the older population who have landlines and the older population are more concerned about Medicare. So it's a not a true picture of the whole population. Another problem that can occur that can create bias is what we call non-response. It occurs when an individual is chosen, but they can't be contacted or they refuse to participate. So they're chosen, but they can't participate or they don't participate. So a survey about unemployment was conducted over the phone during the day. Well, over the phone during the day doesn't, people who are not working are available during the day, most likely. And those who are working are not available during the day. So it's going to um, attract those who are not working. So people who are work are less, less likely to answer the phone or decline to answer questions because they're busy, especially during the day. This could overestimate the proportion that are unemployed because only people who are unemployed, almost only, are the ones who are going to respond to this survey. Okay, a couple AP exam tips for you. If you're asked to describe how the design of a study leads to bias, you're expected to do two things. First of all, ex identify the problem with the design, like it's, um, it's a convenient sample or it's voluntary response or something like that. And then make sure to explain how this problem could lead to an underestimate or an overestimate of the parameter we're looking for. Okay, you have to have that second component to get full credit. So most many students lose credit when describing what can go wrong 
in sample surveys because they inc use incorrect terminology also. While it's important for students to understand and use the vocabulary statistics correctly, they're rarely required to use specific vocabularies in their responses. So if you're not sure of the right wording, just describe what's going on. That can work as well. So let's look at this example. To estimate the proportion of families that oppose budget cuts to the athletic department, the principal surveys families as they enter the football stadium on Friday night. Explain how this plan will result in bias and how the bias will affect the estimated proportion. All right, so what would I say? I would say families who attend football games will typically oppose athletic budget cuts. Responses to the study gathered by a convenience sample, because they just went to the stadium, will most likely overestimate the opposition compared to the true opinion of all high school families. Okay, you would not necessarily get the same result at a football game as you would at a band concert for this question in mind. So because I'm going to a football stadium, those people are invested in football and athletics, they're going to overestimate what their true opposition is. It's not going to give us a good picture of the whole population. All right, let's look at this one. A recent online poll posed the question, should female athletes be paid the same as men for the work that they do? In all, 44% said yes, and 50% said no. And the remaining 1,448 said they don't know. In spite of the large sample size for the survey, we can't trust this result. Well, why not? Well, it's an online poll. Notice that. This is it right there. It's an online poll. That means they chose themselves to answer in the survey. So people who feel strongly about the issue in both directions will be more likely to take this poll, which is a voluntary response sample. This will likely overestimate both the yeses and the noes, and then underestimate those, the true proportion or true population opinion of those who don't know. So if, if it truly was a random sample, it may be more balanced. But because the people who feel strongly about it are choosing themselves for the survey, there's going to be some overestimation of um, the yeses and the noes in this situation.